Thank you so much and welcome to Student Affair. What are we calling it? Harmony? Divisional meeting, end of the year celebration and all of it. So, with me today, you probably are wondering who is this strange person on the stage? But you know what? She is the most important person you need to get to know. Um, so Harmony, would you like to introduce yourself? So it's a pleasure to be here with you. My name is Harmony Frederick, and I'm the executive assistant for VP Franklin and also the manager of strategic initiatives for the division. I'm also a class of 2007 Toro Go Toros. <laughs> So I'm coming back home, and uh, before uh, starting my work here, I worked for 15 years in higher education, a lot of it in fundraising, particularly annual giving and alumni engagement. And in my work in alumni engagement, I got to do a lot with students because honestly, the alumni experience begins with the student experience. And so um, I did all kinds of things from student resource fairs, I took students to Costco and Boeing for professional development activities, did a lot with mentorship, and so I just had a great time I'm working in the student affairs space, and so I'm glad to be a part of what you all do, and you all have welcomed me with open arms, and I truly appreciate that. So, uh, part of my job as manager of strategic initiatives is to get it together for events like this. And so, I just want to go over a couple of uh, rules for the hybrid environment. So, as you can see behind you, we are actually live streaming this presentation. Uh, hey, hi, live stream community. Thank you for joining us. And so, uh, they will hear everything that's spoken into a microphone. If you don't speak into a microphone, they're not going to hear you. They're also not going to hear some of the audience reactions and things of that nature, too. More, we as speakers and presenters can, you know, telegraph these things and talk to the live stream audience better. So sometimes you might say, oh, the audience is laughing at what I just said or something like that, just so that the live stream audience knows what's up in the room because we want them to be a part of it. And to our live stream audience, uh, we'll have the opportunity for you to participate in Q&A as well. You can do it via the moderated chat or if you want to be email vpsa at csudh.edu, our vice president of student affairs account, we'll pick up questions there too. So, I'm going to give it back to Dr. Dane. And I'm supposed to know what to say next. But, okay, we have a hand up right there already. Access to live stream. Access to live stream is via a YouTube link. Uh, and uh, the folks who registered for live stream should have that link, but uh, if somebody needs it, have them email the VPSA at csudh.edu account and we'll get it to them. So would, still, would that still be live? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just want to make sure. Okay, and so we have a lot in store for you, kind of. Uh, first of all, you're probably wondering where is the boss? I trust me, he will magically appear. And then follow that, you would hear from um, Dr. Matt Smith, Dr. Herbert, and lastly, um, Dr. Brandon. And also, we'll get to um, answer some of your questions. But right now, for, you know, just to get everybody going, there's a couple things I wanted to share. You know, those stress ball brain that Dr. Herbert brought to share with us? Make sure you all have it, because at the end, there will be a contest. We'll be throwing that at each other. And who's the last standing will win an award from me. So on me. So just remember that. Now, Harmony prepped me, and right now she's thinking, oh my god, she's going off script. And I don't know what she's going to say next. Harmony prepped me and to, say, um, to talk about what exciting things we are expecting next term. I have so much exciting thing, Harmony, um, so many. And let me share some with you. One is I'm going to get to use an air fryer whom my, which my husband mailed to me, shipped to me for my birthday, an air fryer for my birthday. <laughs> when I live alone and my cholesterol is like 270, so I'm going to be using the air fryer. My son will be a freshman in college somewhere. He's keeping it a secret. I don't know where he's applying. 
And he's telling me he doesn't want parents to interfere with his personal business, even though we are paying the bill. So we're going to have a lot of, you know, a long talk about that. But my, my most exciting things, two things. One, to see students on this campus back once again and to get to know all of you. Because Dr. Brandon and I, when we got here, with just a few weeks, you know, the campus was kind of normal. And then we were sent home. And ever since then, it, feel, it doesn't feel like we work on camp, college campus, right? So in January, I just can't wait. And my second most exciting thing is Harmony. <laughs> because she's going to get our life in order. She's going to help us communicate better. And we have so much to look forward to with Harmony joining our team. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to her before I go on and do actual stand-up comedian. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Dang, and thank you. I'm so glad to be working with all of you. So yeah, where is VP Franklin? Well, as you can see, he isn't here today, but he did provide a message for us, which I'll play right now. Hey, good afternoon, student affairs, as evidenced oh. by the fact that I am sitting here. It would be good if you could see it. I promise I'm better than this. There we are. Afternoon, student affairs, as evidenced by the fact that I am sitting here in my office and I'm not standing or sitting with you in the union at this time means that there obviously was a conflict. In my zest and zeal to meet as a division, before the end of the term and to connect with you all in a way that is meaningful given how difficult this year has been, I did not factor in travel time. So I am literally on a plane coming back from Texas Southern University where my niece, my youngest niece, graduated with her Bachelor's of Arts. I tell you, I couldn't be more proud of her. And as the Vice President, if I wish that, want that, and work hard for that for the 18,000 students that we serve, you got to know that family is really critical. And if you knew her story and her journey, you would know why I'm so excited and why I needed to be there, wanted to be there, planned to be there. But what I didn't factor in is travel time back. Thank goodness Harmony is here now because she's bringing a lot of harmony to my schedule. But listen, I still wanted you all to meet. I still wanted you all to celebrate because this has been a difficult year and we have made it through. Spring semester is upon us and that's one of the things that I really wanted to talk to you about. I'm excited about us coming back. I know that we're gonna have 80% of our courses and more that will be in person, which means that many, many students will come back. I know that that's difficult for a lot of you. There's some psychological pieces around returning to that many people on campus. I recognize that. But what I also recognize is that our students need us. They need us to be in our offices, in our units, in our divisions, doing those things that we did pre-pandemic, connecting and helping students belong. So I want to work with your managers and work with you so that there's equity around how we schedule time. But right now, we're back. And we're coming back in a way that's going to help our students thrive and it's going to help us thrive. And more importantly, I wanted, I was so anxious to share with you some of the findings from the NASPA recommendations, and we're still going to get to that. And even later in the program, there are going to be some things that will be shared in terms of the direction and the way that we're trying to move this division forward. We will never be the same again. This pandemic, this 18 to 24 months that we've been away means that higher education has to change. It means that CSU Dominguez Hills has to change. More importantly, it means that student affairs needs to change in ways that can help us deliver what our students deserve, the best that we have to offer, so they can come and get the best that they need here at the university. So my apologies again for missing this celebration, but I want you to know 
I am going to have the time of my life hanging out with family and celebrating this young woman's accomplishments. I couldn't be more proud of her. I couldn't be more proud of you all. And as a family, my Dominguez Hills family, I cannot wait to see you in the new year as we begin to move this university and this division forward in ways that's going to prioritize our students' experience and to help them get what they came here for, the degree in hand and a learning and living experience that complements how brilliant they are and how brilliant we are in terms of helping them achieve their greatness. So I look to talk to you all soon. See you in the new year. And now we are fortunate to have with us Dr. Matt Smith. Dr. Matt is going to give us a series of presentations. Thank you, Dr. Matt. No problem. Hey, everyone. Am I coming through on this mic? All right. How's everybody doing? Good. So we have a, a couple things we wanted to cover in this time together. Um, like Dr. Franklin mentioned, um, you all, and you all know we're preparing for the our return to campus with 80 percent of our courses being back in person and um, there's been a lot of conversations about that we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, today as well we're going to have a um, a few uh, dr brandon dr herbert's going to come up in a little bit and join me up here um, to answer any questions you may have um, it's a difficult time this has been a really difficult semester um, many of you would probably attest personally this has been like the most challenging semester i've had in my professional life just with everything going on it was a challenging semester for us for a lot of different reasons. And thinking about returning in the spring um, brings a lot of anxiety, a lot of questions that we may have. And so we want to be able to answer some of those questions that you may have, talk about expectations for, for the spring and just kind of where we are, and as well as some of the things that we're excited about. Um, th there's also some, some change on the horizon for our campus, and so we want to talk a little bit about that and, and then just, get, again, give you all opportunities to ask us any questions you may have. Sound good? Good. So first and foremost, what we wanted to talk to you about was Toro Hour. Um, can, you, can you all give ASI a hand for me for a second? Um, ASI has been fighting for a university hour that we uh, call Toro Hour for years. Um, it's a real important piece that's really going, it has the potential to change a lot of the ways that we do student engagement on campus, the way that we can build community with one another on campus. Um, and so we're really excited and really appreciative for ASI leading the charge on this front. Because while we are away during the pandemic, one of the things that came up from the surveys that Alana was doing was this, that people said the thing they missed the most about being on campus was being able to just have casual conversations, interactions, and just being in community with people. Believe it or not, it wasn't all of our meetings. I, I, don't, I, I thought that was definitely going to be at the top of the list, but people just miss seeing each other. And so we thought this was a great opportunity for us to try to go back to Senate to see if we could get Toro Hour across the finish line. Um, and so Jonathan, our ASI president, the ASI team, Liana, our, the ASI graduate student, uh, as well as other student leaders, um, worked with Academic Senate um, and Senate exec in particular. Um, and we got approved for a pilot Toro Hour in spring 2022. And so we wanted to talk to you just a little bit about that, right? So one semester, university hour, every Tuesday and Thursday from 2.30 to 3.45, we will have very few classes that are scheduled during that time. Essentially, in, in, in the ideal scenario, there's none, but there are certain majors that have really high unit majors, certain labs, things that just can't be moved. And so they'll be meeting along with a few other classes during this time, but this will be this way for the entire spring semester. Um, and it's an opportunity for student engagement, student activities, clubs and orgs, leadership meetings, things that we wanna plan during that time, as well as opportunities for faculty and staff to get together and connect um, and plan events for students, plan events for, for us to connect as well. Um, so we sent out a survey just so that you all know, this is some students said they want to spend this time in various ways, that's what this data, and we can make these slides available to you all. But essentially, students didn't say that they just want to do one thing. There's a number of things, depending on the day, time, that they want to do. Uh, so in terms of social time and well-being, you just want to relax, take a mental, mental health break, just you know, be able to eat, hang out with friends. They also talked about wanting to spend time with advisors, go to professor's office hours, 
um, using that as an opportunity to, to engage in those spaces, um, using this time as an opportunity to explore other resources, studying in the library, getting a, going to advising or the writing center. And so we just believe that this will be an amazing time uh, for us as a campus to really engage and enhance student engagement uh, on our campus. And so um, we're form we have a small committee right now that we've been working with, and that committee will expand um, once we uh, come back after the winter break. We'll, we'll uh, really use the committee to help coordinate really large-scale, significant things that need to happen during Toro Hour, as well as assess the impact of Toro Hour. And so um, what we want to do on this front is really, this doesn't mean that, like we're not dictating what departments and offices have to do during Toro Hour, but what we are saying is that Tuesdays, Thursdays from 2.30 to 3.45 is a great time to engage with students, great time to engage with colleagues and faculty on, and across campus, great time uh, for us to really just try to focus on building community. But we also have to remember that not everybody's here on Tuesday, Thursday, so we still will you know, have other things happening outside of that time frame on Monday, Wednesdays as well for students who aren't here during that time. Um, but, but we're really excited about that opportunity. We have to go back to Senate in the spring, give them data on what Toro Hour has meant and who's engaging and who's participating. Um, and then they will uh, make, try to take it up and make a decision on whether Toro Hour is something that we're gonna keep for the long haul. Um, and so that, that's kind of uh, wh what we want to share with you. It's a bird's eye view of what we, we're expecting. Um, when we come back to school in the fall, you all may hear, or in the spring, you're going to hear about like a welcome back activities that we're trying to plan. Some of those will happen during Toro Hour. Some of them will happen during other times. Harmony's really leading the effort on that front. As you all know, we have about two classes of students who have never been to campus before. And so we wanna do everything we can to welcome them, to help students transition back. And so they're putting together things that, uh, that, that, that will help with that transition. And we're also looking at leveraging Toro Hour to help on that front as well. Sound good? So I'm gonna, Harmony, you think I should just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through, then we'll do questions on, on all of these at the very end, okay? So, we're going to talk about Go Far Together. How many of you remember an email that came from the provost, Dr. Franklin, and VP Manriquez, probably, now it was probably, what, three, four weeks ago, about student success, um, and just kind of how students were struggling during COVID? Uh, in the email, they said that Dr. Castino and I would lead an effort to kind of realign and revisit our student success efforts. So that's what these slides I'm going to kind of quickly fly through. Uh, we've been meeting with different stakeholders across campus around this, but this is some really significant change for, for our campus um, in terms of some of the things that, we, uh, that, that folks have been working on for a long time, and I'll highlight some of that. And Go Far Together is also the theme of our strategic plan. Um, and so this is really, when you look at the strategic plan, this is really uh, one of our main themes in the strategic plan is around students thriving. Um, and, and so it really centers student success and the student experience. And that's, that's what this is. So best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. These are the slides that our VPs gave us um, that I'm just sharing with you. They basically <laughs> telling us, we can't change what hasn't happened or what decisions were made before, but we're really excited about the work that lies ahead, right? This is a great opportunity for us to do some amazing work across campus and really reimagine what we mean by student success and what that looks like on our campus. So this didn't come out of nowhere. It started years ago with a visit from Inside Track that when they came to, to look at our, uh, what was happening on our campus around advising. The CSU released a briefing document on advising for the system and offered some recommendations. Um, Inside Track produced a, a needs assessment report um, that offered recommendations for our campus on what we could do to really improve the work that was going on. There was some work led by Dr. Dang um, to look at the Inside Track report, look at the CSU briefing document, talk about what changes, what wrote it with these recommendations, what might this look like on our campus? And they did a great job of outlining that and providing a roadmap for what this might look like for us moving forward. And then some of you may, may recall, Dr. Kim Costino and I have been working for now over a year, started this process in the middle of COVID to do this strategic plan. We are almost at the finish line. I cannot wait to be at the finish line with this strategic plan. But a lot of this is all there too, right? So we were having conversations with students, faculty, staff, alumni, community members around student success, around the student experience, and a whole host of other things. 
And so from all of that, um, in, in while that was happening, the three VPs that I mentioned earlier called their AVPs together and said, we need to have a conversation around student success. It's not going well. What is it that we need to prioritize? What is it that we need to do? And that was in August of 2020, and we've been meeting ever since with them, and that's where all of this is coming from, and more, other work that was even done before this. And so the pillar of learn together in our, in our strategic plan and in this work, really what we're talking about is doing a host of things and really addressing some of the things in curriculum. So we know that one of the biggest barriers to student success on our campus is DFW, so we want to reduce DFWs, work with faculty, create learning communities, faculty, students, advisors, and all of them to reduce that. We're also going to create what we refer to as FIGs, our first year interest groups. This is where we'll cohort students into classes during their first year. Um, E-portfolios will also be a part of this. Well, students, undergraduate students will be required to do e-portfolios as part of this reflective learning exercise during their time here at Dominguez Hills. And then we're going to redesign advising. <clears throat> so advising will look different than it does today. We also want, un under our pillar of five together, we're gonna increase financial support to students. So we want to make sure, if, if, for those of you who don't know, we have a pretty small pool of scholarships and grants for students, and we wanna drastically increase that pool. We also uh, want to build, develop a community-based wellness model that Dr. Herbert and HR are working on together. And then we want to leverage Toro Hour to really you know, support the health, wellness, and overall engagement on our campus. And so what this means, that means that we're going to both have to have a strategy realignment and a structural realignment. Structural, that means de departments, divisions, reporting lines are going to shift. Uh, things will look different to, uh, in the future, in the near future, than they do today. But it also means that a strategy realignment. That if all that we change is who people report to and we think that things are going to be different, then you know, we've really missed this moment to take stock of what we should be learning as institutions of higher education and how we can move forward during this time. And so we have to change the way we work, how we work, how we conceptualize our work. And that also means that we have to invest in the areas that we say are important. We have to really get strategic with our budget. So, we're investing in change management. We'll be working with EAB uh, to, because change is difficult. And we recognize that for all staff, administrators, faculty that are impacted by this. We, we recognize that. And so we're working with EAB to help us understand how to do change well and better than we have in the past. We also believe that we need to develop an office of first and second year experiences to kind of help students with that transition. Um, again, adv redesigning advising integrating learning support into the curriculum and into the student experience, leveraging university housing and the residence hall that we're developing as well as future developments of housing to develop like a living learning community. And then also making sure that we're paying attention to the second year and not just the first year, right? That there's warm handoffs in that second year. What type of support do students need on that front? So this has huge implications for everywhere on campus. We're basically saying everyone, every role, every division, Every department in academic affairs, essentially, in student affairs, is going to have to reimagine who they are, their roles, titles, how we do our work, and it's going to be a huge shift for all of us. This is an example of what something might look like in one of the colleges, where you have student success teams, take the College of Arts and Humanities, and you have a major advisor, a career advisor, uh, someone that, like a graduation specialist or a completion coordinator, a case manager to help with basic needs, mental health things and they're all working together, coordinating together to support student success inside of that college. And that's just an example. It doesn't show the structures around it that, would have to, that we would need to stand up in order to support this, but just an example. So again, we believe, we're, we're, we've been meeting with people to talk about some of these key things. We're having a retreat with leaders in January where we're, uh, there's about 65 people from across campus, faculty, staff, administrators, students, who are gonna be meeting with us over for a few days um, in Redondo Beach talking about these changes and what this means for the institution moving forward. Some of these changes will begin to take place after that retreat. Uh, we'll slowly begin to see those and really be in a pilot mode come fall 2022. So this is where we're going. Um, everyone has to reimagine what their work is and how things are gonna look moving forward. No one's losing a job. Right? So we're committing to do no harm. Part of this, we think that it was a great opportunity to leverage some of the talent and expertise we have on campus to open up opportunities for people to advance their careers. We're not saying that we're going to lay people off or demote people. This is really about repurposing 
um, reimagining our work, thinking about where we can plug people in to better position them to help students and, and, and improve the student experience. And so it really isn't about what's moving to academic affairs, what's moving to student affairs, what isn't reporting to us. This is really about what do we need to do in order to best like move forward in the best way to support student success and improve the overall experience of our students. And so that is where we are. That is a quick rundown of, um, of those changes that are on the horizon. And we'll, in January, we'll give us an opportunity to really dig deep um, and really understand what those org charts, what the strategy will be moving forward, um, and, and trying to figure that out uh, to collectively as a, as a Dominguez Hills family. And so, so that's where we are, and you'll hear more about this as, this, uh, as the beginning of the next semester begins to get closer to us. All right. Oh, see? There we are. So Harmony, don't know where you are, but that's okay. No, you're good. So all we're going to do now, so I know that was a, a lot. So both Torah Hour, the reorg, this is supposed to be a time where you can really ask us questions. It can be about anything I just shared, but also about, again, about repopulation um, and anything you may no need to know information that you feel like is still unclear to you um, or anything of, along those lines. And so I'm gonna, Dr. Brandon's going to come up, Dr. Herbert's going to come up. Um, let's see here, Donisha, you can come on up too. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, and, and you all, and so they're gonna have, a, have you ask questions. If, you're, if you have a question, just feel free to come up to the mic so people that are live streaming can hear what the question is and then we will respond into the mics um, like, a, like a press conference that I never got as a professional athlete. But you missed. Uh, I missed? You missed having a press I conference. I didn't want to have one. Uh, so any questions you may have, that is what this time is for. Have at least one. If Make not, us feel we can like just get straight to the food. Me as am I. Jonathan, thank you. How's it going, everyone? Um, I, I wanted to know what specific changes were happening because I feel like that was a very broad stroke. Um, so if you can go to the specifics as a student, I'd love to know what's going on. We do not have the specifics that we can share right now. We're sharing those in January. You'll be at the retreat with us, right? Yes. So that is when you will get the specifics. Uh, there's a process we have to go through to talk to certain individuals on campus that, and certain departments and things like that, and then to also the provost and, the, and Dr. Franklin have not officially stamped any official changes to take place yet. They, I, we expect that to happen in the next couple of weeks. Um, and so once that's stamped, then by the time the retreat comes, then we'll be able to kind of unpack that with everybody else. And I think one of the other things that's important is that the process is intended to be inclusive. Uh, and it's, included, it's designed to get input from all the stakeholders and not make some decisions in isolation because that will not make it successful. So I think when you say, you know, specific steps, those are coming from all the different constituents and stakeholders that we're seeking the information from. So when you talk about reimagining advising, um, there will be advising people who, will be, who actually do advising now who will be providing their expertise to say, what about this, what about that, what about this? When you talk about a living and learning community, you have the same thing. So it's designed to really be inclusive uh, and not kind of a top down and say, here's what we're going to do without having the stakeholders uh, provide their feedback. Yeah, thank you for that, Dr. Brennan, too, yeah. And, and, and just so that you know, the reason why we can't, Kim and I have spent the last month just meeting with those departments and having this conversation and asking them about their questions, concerns, things we should take into consideration. All of that we've get, getting now to our VPs so that they can take all of that as they kind of provide us with a framework that we'll talk about uh, in January. Yeah. Is this on? Oh, it is on. Okay. I'm louder in my head sometimes than I think <laughs> I am. I had a question for Dr. Brandon. Um, as somebody who works directly with our student population, specifically student athletes, I think one of the things that we noticed over the pandemic was how prohibitive some of our processes were to students. And so there were some things that changed. So thank you to you and your staff um, for making some of those changes. But with that, one of the things that I noticed was really tough for students 
was our credit no credit withdrawal policies. And I know with the faculty giving the green light to go ahead and do the late withdraw again for fall and spring, well in some cases good, in, in other cases it's not so great. And so I wanted to find out more about why maybe some options were chosen to not go with a no credit, allowing students to do a late no credit. I know for our population that would have been more helpful than the late withdraw. But then are there other steps that we're gonna take to kind of make some of these processes less laborious? So for example, if I wanna do a late withdraw, why do I have to jump through, as a student, why do I have to jump through so many hoops and re-explain my situation four times at least? just to be able to say I need to withdraw instead of just being able to work with my major advisor to say, hey, these are the things that are happening to me right now that are requiring the need to withdraw. So that's like six questions in one. <laughs> I, I, my I got three answers, well, I'm 50%. I got you, no. Okay, I you. My, I know, my colleagues in <laughs> athletics know I'm, I'm good for some random ones, yes. but. <laughs> no, thank you for your question because I think it's important that we understand the Academic Senate made the decision to allow late withdrawals. That was, that began the first semester of COVID. Uh, and it was really to address the fact that students had to go from being in an in-person to virtual environment with no preparation. I mean, it, the whole campus had to change. So they said, well, it's not really fair to students because some students are better learners in person than they are virtual and they had to adjust. So the Academic Senate, and it's something that happened on almost all of the CSU campuses, decided that they would extend the day for students to withdraw and or the student to take no credit, no credit. Um, We've been doing that. This is all going to be our third semester. Correct me if I'm wrong, it's our third semester. So they voted again to do it for the fall and for the spring. There aren't the hoots. The student can actually, does not need a whole lot of explanation and does not need the signatures to do a late withdrawal from the campus as they do in a regular term without this academic senate resolution. So the student can go there. They don't need all the signatures that they normally need in terms of doing a late withdrawal and or changing a course from credit to no credit. However, they must do it though by December the 20th because that in impacts closing out a term and starting up another term. It also impacts SAP. Um, and that's one of the things we're working internally in terms of how can we turn those around a lot faster in light of the fact that the term is ending, well, the student can do this through December 20th. The reality is we will probably not get to those SAPs until the beginning of the new year. There's just no way. Uh, the staff will be, uh, you know, wanting to take some time off for the holiday. Students don't necessarily turn it in on time. Um, the Academic Senate believed that it was a good thing. One of the things we are preparing is a report for them in terms of the number of students that are doing this, that have done it, and what impact it may have on their academic career here at, uh, at DH. Did I get all your questions? Which one did I miss? No, you got all of them, thank you. Okay. It made me think of another one. So you had mentioned that students will be able to do the late no credit then, because when I see the form, it only looks like it's for late withdrawals. But can they do a late no credit? Did I miss something? John, you wanna give the specifics on that? John Hill is the new uh, is our registrar, so he can give the specifics on that. Okay, so they can only just do the late withdrawal. Okay, I just wanted to get, because I was getting really excited and was gonna run back to my office, but okay, yeah, I'll wait it's now. just for Thanks. the late withdrawal. Don't run. Yeah, don't run. <laughs> it's just for the late withdrawal. And if you have some extenuating circumstances in terms of a student, please bring it to our attention. Um, we will be, again, looking at the policy, but we also don't wanna do any harm to a student um, because of a policy. Um, and that's one of the things we're providing in the report. Or what are the unintended consequences of doing this? Um, and, and again, we will pr provide that information. But we believe, like the Academic Senate, that it, it's a good thing for the students. While we wait for the next question, um, I wanted to say something about the information that Matt shared. Um, you know, I really want to give a shout out to all of you. Um, we went virtual. The university did not fall apart. It is still standing. Our students are still here. Um, I was up at Sonoma a couple weeks ago. They lost 3,000 students. So 3,000, so from 9,000 to 6,000. We're not in that shape. And so I think that says a lot about your effort, your hard work, your commitment. And a part of what Matt is sharing and the things that we've been talking about is how to preserve some of that, preserve some of the strengths that have come out of the pandemic, preserve some of the things that have been shown through the pandemic, 
be able to really look at the way we do work. Um, eight to five, maybe it's not eight to five, you know, maybe it's not five days a week, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's not a lot of different things. And so really capitalize on the things that we've learned from the pandemic and shift a little bit. So Jonathan, when you ask about, um, you know, what that really means, I, I, I hope to, you could just take, everyone here can take this kind of into mind is that we don't wanna just drop everything from the pandemic and say, hey, back to normal because there is no back to normal. We're still in a pandemic, we're still trying to, I'm still getting questions about the HEPA filters, the N95 masks, which we do have in the health center, we, you know, all of these sorts of things. And so how do we come out of the pandemic or close to out, preserving some of the things and some of the strengths that the staff have shown during, during this time? And I think it's a model where people will, although the particulars are not there, the spirit is good, and it's a model where I think people will feel more um, happy, satisfied, and able to preserve a little more work-life balance. Um. <laughs> Go work-life balance. <laughs> Any other questions? question and kind of, I guess, a statement related to learning communities. So first, I wanted to know, is it just living learning communities that you're doing? And then um, if not, would there be an opportunity for advisors to potentially teach some sort of learning community to students? Because I think that most of my colleagues who are advisors can agree we notice students kind of would benefit from a lot of um, college success skills that we might be able to teach and also um, it would be kind of like a professional development opportunity for us, which I feel like we often get overlooked for. Yeah. Awesome. So when you say um, learn, teach a learning community, are you talking about like an actual four credit course? So for instance, when I was at Long Beach, my um, college advising center taught a one unit, six week long course. That was an intro to college. We learned how to write an email to professors um, about study abroad. We learned about getting involved on campus, um, which are all things that I think we go over in our advising meetings. But oftentimes, it's a lot more helpful to have a captive audience of 20 to 30 students in a class where they feel like, OK, I'm here. I'm going to learn about this information, as opposed to just the 45 minutes we get in an advising session. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so. I see a hand in the back, but I'm gonna. So we are not just talking about living learning communities. There are other learning communities that we're talking about. The actual question of over um, advisors teaching th those courses, there are some barriers that we've run into recently when we've tried that. And you may, if you've inquired about this, may 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 know. There's there's th issue, union issues um, that that we have to deal with, um, and but there are ways around that. And so as we invite advisors into the conversation with us and to be a part of some of these other learning communities with faculty and, and students and staff uh, to learn about how we're going to um, you know, do, realign curriculum and co-curricular experiences and things like that on campus, I think that has to be part of the conversation and figuring out how might advisors be able to lead those type of activities. There is a way, but it's not as easy and straightforward as um, we would hope, uh, probably. Right? And so I think in, any of that is definitely can be on the table, um, but that's why we have to have everyone engage in that process with us. Yeah. I wanted to add to that, you mentioned, uh, uh, Bri, and you mentioned a good point about professional development, and that's really um, <clears throat> at the core of Student Affairs mission, returning, yeah. is really reinvesting or investing in staff and professional development. And I think we sometimes, and we, I've had many conversations with all of you where we're just trying to catch the train and we're just trying to run and catch it and hopefully catch it and not fall. And really we have to stop and think about um, how to get ahead of the train, how to stay at the station. And maybe that's not the stop for you anymore. Maybe you need to pivot and be in another area. Maybe you've gone back to school. You've gotten a different degree. Maybe there's another place for you here. And so it's not that you have to get a degree or you have to learn a skill and leave Dominguez. No, we want to be able to understand what are your strengths? What do you enjoy? 
how to feed into that a little bit more and then kind of, as Matt says, a repurpose is kind of like a Walmart term, but I would <laughs> repurpose you <laughs> into, another, into another area that where you can thrive. And so this is taxing work. So everyone in here is at the foundation of you know, success. And so there, there's a lifespan on that. So after maybe five years, you may not wanna be at the front line anymore. You may need another, uh, thing to do, right? And so this is really about developing those pieces of the staff in a, in, a, in a way that works for you, but also works for our students. All right, Harmony here with a question from our online audience. I have a few students who either can't return in the spring or can only return part-time due to balances on their account. Will there be any additional flexibility in regards to payment plans? That's a great question. <laughs> uh, I, would, I would recommend that the individual check with student financials uh, in terms of that. I know that they have been mindful of COVID and the impact that it is having on students and families and trying to adjust their payment plan accordingly. So there is some flexibility with regards to it, but they also have uh, some things in terms of uh, making sure that they get the money in a reasonable amount of time. So I would say check with student financial services. There's a new individual there, Ryan, uh, who would be very helpful in terms of working with you in terms of a, uh, a payment plan. And I would also add to check with our basic needs program for any students who are experiencing any challenges financially. We have more money than normal. Hey, Morgan. Um, more, we, you know, prior to the pandemic, our main source of supporting students like this was through our emergency grant, our iHeart Toros. We now have different pots of money that we could access, and depending on the situation, um, students could be eligible to get some financial assistance to help with, to help with that very type of situation. So, so just let us know. Reach out to the Basic Needs Program. Thank you. Oh, so my name is Tiffany, and I work in a disability office. And I wanted to piggyback off of the young lady who was talking about the potential, like um, University 101. Mm -hmm when I attended Long Beach for a hot semester, it was too much for me. I came to Dominguez, but they did have like a one week program to introduce the students to the campus. And as much as we do a good job at uh, orientation, it doesn't really connect the students. And I think sometimes we make a lot of assumptions that students know how to do certain things. And an example with the pandemic was that um, a lot of the students, some staff and faculty did not know how to use Zoom or certain online um, resources, right? So um, maybe providing something that is not a mandatory um, training, but something that students can access along with staff and faculty to like kind of keep people updated of the different resources or technologies that are there because we never know when we may need to use them. So just imagine we all probably dealt with somebody at some point in time who did not know how to use Zoom and it was very difficult to communicate with them or try to walk them through how to share a screen, how to access certain things. And so just even sometimes how the emails are worded by our students. We've had students who say, I don't know what a subject line is. So some things that we assume that students may know or even staff or faculty, it's just know, just to have that resource there in some form or fashion. And I know it's not for someone to do a class, but if they had at least like a training where we could say, look, you can access this, you know, I think that'll be beneficial to the campus. Thank you. Yeah, and, and for all the advisors and people who are interested in those, like our, on our campus, we, our UNV 101 is different. If you say, I wanna do UNV 101, you're gonna get the door slammed in your face. But if you say you want to do, um, I don't know, like a six week, one unit internship, like s s type of thing, that, that's a different type of conversation. Or, or co-teach with some, like, so we can, there's, there's certain ways that we, we have to frame those, but I think that's a great point, because I know other campuses frame them as a UNV 101, and that's why th those conversations got shut down so quick on us before, because UNV 101 is something totally different here that um, we would not be able to kind of go in and teach a UNV 101 course. And I have another question from the audience, but just one comment on that too. Um, plugging Toro Connect, if you all have heard about it from the alumni angle, that's how I knew about it. 
And they use this background system called People Grove as a part of Toro Connect, and it actually provides these templates that help students write messages to people that they want to connect with. So I don't know if that helps, but that came to mind when you brought up that. Uh, when you brought that up. Um, okay. So online question. Can you share more regarding the vision and possible program services of the Wellness Hub? What role do you envision for related departments or auxiliaries? Well, I'm excited about the Wellness Hub. It's, um, I can't tell you how many calls I get from faculty, administrators, staff that say, I'm watching Harmony, she's the director of all things, um, that say, can we come get services in the health center? And so, and, well, I don't want to go to HR. I don't want, so, so what happens is we became the hub for all things, all things health and wellness in the Student Health Center. And so the Toro Wellness Hub is really the brainchild of myself partnering with HR, uh, Sean Milton, around trying to build a community wellness plan. So it's not HR versus Student Health Center. It's not did you pay the fee versus not paying the fee. Those things are still real, and student fee fees will not be used for staff, Jonathan. Let me just make that clear. Yeah. <laughs> but it's really about housing information and places where we can bridge and we can share. So in January, expect many of you to be invited to a collaborative where we will pull together our resources. So athletics is doing some sort of um, basketball training you know, day. We're, that's a part of wellness. We'll integrate it into the wellness hub. So you no longer have to call, you know, Dr. Herbert, do you have this? Wait, let's call HR. I'll tell you that only 20 some odd people use EAP. 20 some odd people. And I know I've received more than 20 some odd calls. So it tells you, I mean, I click delete on the emails just like you do when they come from benefit services. So we have to think a little bit differently about how we envision this, how we talk about mental health, how we talk about physical health, how we talk about that, not, not in general, but for our campus in particular. So the Toro Wellness Hub is open to all of you. It's, it's a whole campus-wide event um, or plan. And so come along, you have an event. The kinesiology students, we're doing a workout every week. We'll showcase them. Faculty are doing some research on maybe anxiety. We'll showcase them. So it's really a hub. So it's not just about me programming. It's really about bringing the information all together. You have an idea. You have something you want to try to cultivate. Give me a call. Most people know Josephine Lara. She's a... Uh, the bomb, and so just call her, <laughs> um, and uh, we can loop you in the network, and you'll expect to start seeing some emails on the Wellness Hub uh, come spring. And I know we're, we're about to close out right now, but I, uh, um, there was one thing that I didn't mention that uh, when you brought up Josephine's name that I wanted to announce and, and have you all keep an eye out for. Um, and it's again about repopu repopulating the campus and coming back and students being here. Like, we recognize how difficult that was going to be, this is going to be on people for various different reasons. Um, and we didn't want to proceed in this naive and, or aloof way without stopping and recognizing uh, the loss um, and some of the, the hurt and pain that has taken place over the last um, 18 to going on 24 months. And so early in the semester, um, I guess it would be what is it, student health, student psychological services. Josephine will be planning a couple of events for the campus to kind of just pause, reflect, um, some healing spaces for us to reflect on, on the la what has taken place, inviting students, staff, faculty to participate in those spaces as well. Uh, and so just be on the lookout for that because as we look at Toro Hour, we look at welcome back events and look at some of these things, a reorganization and, and all of those things, we also want to make sure that early in this process, uh, we're taking some time to just uh, reflect, um, you know, and, 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 and be in that space with one another and acknowledge the hurt, the pain, the loss, um, and, and try to figure out, you know, healthy ways for us to move forward together. And this is one of those things that when you see the email come out, it's not, you're no longer going to start seeing just for students. Now, our, our individual services, our health services, and shout out to our health staff who have been here through the pandemic. So I'm really grateful for them. 
Um, but those services are designated for students, but all of these other things are about community health. And so you see an event, you show up. You don't have to just say, this is for my student. So it's an opportunity for, uh, we're all grieving. We've all experienced loss. So we all need to heal together. All right, so thank you to our panel. And I'm gonna keep you here for just a moment because I have a special task for you if you don't mind. So we have some exciting giveaways for uh, some lucky winners. And we're gonna draw eight different folks. And so, uh, Dr. Smith, could you advance the slide one if you will, don't mind? And so here is an extensive list. Uh, so what's gonna happen is we're gonna do the drawing right now and I'm gonna contact each one of you to see what you're looking for. So our friends in athletics gave us some really cool giveaways. Thank you, athletics. And then we have some really nice gift cards as well, too. So we're happy to uh, distribute to them to all of you. And I wanted to take a moment, too, to also thank uh, Marcus Jones for uh, posting Dr. Franklin's video on YouTube so that we could all see it. So thanks to everyone who made this event possible. Thank you, Marcus. My hero. <laughs> Ah, uh, the glamorous part of communications. Um, thank you, Dr. Jones. All right. So shy. All right, Dr. Smith, could you draw three from here? Three. Yeah, ideally, these are people who are here in person today or said they were going to be here in person. So fingers crossed you're here so we can be excited for you. I just did this uh, on purpose. It's Matt fixed. Smith. No. Oh, I'm just <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I took these guys out. <laughs> Annalisa Garcia. <laughs> Dwayne Denmark. Ah. And then is it uh, Fucha? Renee. Renee Gaston. Re She's Renee right Gaston. <laughs> Renee here? Is Renee here? So so Dwayne, do they have to be here in person? No, no. Oh, OK. That's the whole point. So right now we're pulling in person because uh, we want to be fair. Next, we're going to pull three from our live stream basket. Is Renee here? No, she, well, she, don't, don't give her a no, gift No, no, no. We're not going to give it away. <laughs> oh. <I'm, laughs> all right, so three as well. I had your back, Renee. I was um, going to keep it, Renee. All right, Jessica Morales. Ah. Okay. Uh, Katie Johnson and Caleb Tapp. All right, live streamers, if that was you, you're going to be getting an email. And these are folks who couldn't come. We're only going to pull two because there were a very small list of people who couldn't come. And also, I want to encourage you all to say no if you can't come because you're still going to get prizes. John Doe. Jane Doe, <laughs> uh, Sandra Rawlings, Rollins, yeah, and Anna Baranga, Aragon, Aragon, very, Anna very good. So I'll be in contact with everyone for their prizes and. Before we leave, we're going to hear from Dr. Brandon, but I just want to give you a bit of direction about where you're going. So we all have these lovely wristbands because we're going to go downstairs and there's a hot chocolate bar, coffee, tea, pastries, and other munchies. If you are some of my vegan or dairy-free friends, we have uh, vegan brownies downstairs for you. So just FYI on that. We also have water for the hot chocolate too if you're dairy-free. So we've tried to think about that. And then uh, you'll see it right as you go down the stairs or down the elevator. It's by where the old Taco Bell used to be. And so it's decorated up to the hilt. You really can't miss where we're going to be. And I hope you can all join us to connect with one another. And now, without further ado, let's advance the slide one more, if you don't mind. Boom. And we'll hear from Dr. Brandon. Um, wow, I even got a whole slide for myself. Uh, that's, that's impressive. Um, I'm, I'm going to take this off for a little while while I speak, and because it's a little bit difficult for me to speak into it. But I want to begin in terms of on behalf of the division. Many of you I have not met. It'll be great to come back to campus and actually meet you um, beyond this kind of environment. But I want to take uh, the time to really say thank you, um, and to thank you for not just what you gave, but for what you went through and what you didn't give. There were times I think as we went through this pandemic, as we're going through it. 
we hopefully we're at the tail end of it. But you think about, you know, one day being here and then the next day being told you got to go home and you got to start doing your job from home. Um, and I had the experience for the first couple of days when I was at home using my laptop. And I'm, uh, I'm 50 plus. It makes it a little bit rough in terms of seeing it through a laptop what it is I'm supposed to be doing. Now, for some of you, it may not be an issue, but for me, it was a big issue. Uh, so I ended up getting some um, uh, additional monitors. But I really want, I think, uh, and I know our president has said it an awful lot, to really thank you for what you've done and for what you've been through and how you've helped our students get through to the other side. And we also want to say there is change. And change is not a bad thing. Uh, some of the changes are good things, especially if you're included in the discussions regarding those changes. I think that it can be, we can come out of the pandemic better than when we went into it. As you think about our repopulation, for some of you there is, for most of you, or I'll speak about only you know, myself because I won't get mad at myself, there is some anxiety about returning uh, back to an environment where there may be somebody who's in a workstation right next to you. And you have your mask on or they don't have their mask on. There may be some anxiety about the interaction in terms of all the students. We're mindful of that, um, that are returning. But we're also mindful that our students enjoy being around each other, just like you enjoy being around other people. If you think about this holiday season when you've had the opportunity to be around other individuals. And again, I want to say, and I want to keep making sure that you understand that we appreciate what you've done we value what you've done. We understand that you've done it from a different place uh, than you've ever maybe experienced it before. And we know that coming back, there are going to be some challenges. We know that some of you would prefer to work from home. And you may be saying, well, we've been doing it for the last two years. What's the problem? Why can't we continue to do that? And as our president has said, because our students need us here. They need to be able to connect with someone. You think about how important that is in terms of that human connection. Uh, that's what we thrive on. I also want to say that, as Dr. Smith talked about going far together, that's one of the things I think that I've embraced here at DH is that people want to work together. They want to thrive together. We don't want our students just to survive. We want them to thrive while they're here at DH. And we're important in terms of that. You're important in terms of that. Because you think about every interaction you have, you never know until that student maybe leaves and they come back and tell you how important that conversation or that you took that time to just talk with them or to explain the process to them or to guide them in a way that just to be there to listen. When we come back, I think we're gonna to need to do a lot more listening with our students. We're gonna to need to do a lot more listening with each other because we're gonna be going through some different experiences that if you don't talk about them, and I'm so glad that you know Dr. Herbert was talking about in terms of the services that are going to be available for everyone. If you don't talk about it and you just sit there in your own space and try and deal with it, we know how difficult that is and we know how that's not good for your own mental, physical, and spiritual health. So again, I don't want to belabor it because there's some hot chocolate downstairs and I know people want to get to their hot chocolate. Um, but I do want to really emphasize thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for the time that you've taken. Uh, thank you uh, for the students that you've helped, for the families that you've helped. Um, and enjoy the holidays. Be safe while you enjoy it, but enjoy the holidays with your family. Enjoy the holidays with your friends. And come back in 2022 rejuvenated, but you'll come back different. And know that we expect that we will come back different. We will not come back the same way we left. We will come back different. Um, we'll come back different as individuals. We'll come back different as a campus and different as a community. So again, I want to really emphasize, thank you. We appreciate what you've done. We value what you've done. And hopefully you will have a great holiday season and we'll see you in 2022. Hey. All right, see you all downstairs.